It's a pleasure to attempt to have the last word uh, following such an imminent um, uh, panel of presenters. Julio, first just to acknowledge already the turning point. Often this iterations of this meeting consisted of debating the science, as Julio pointed out. Uh, we are at a position now where the science is no longer up for debate. Um, uh, what is unequivocal is the imperative, the moral, the public health imperative um, to act and to extend quality differentiated treatment to every single person identified with HIV, no matter where that person lives. What is at stake is whether and how and how quickly policy and funding will follow the science and the evidence that you have created. And that's what my five slides and my 10 minutes will be focused on. How far haven't we come in acting on the science and the evidence that this room has led the world in creating? Um, we've, we've heard already and we will hear uh, all week moments of reflection. Uh, it's been 16 years since this meeting was held in the ICC at Durban. Like many people in this room, I was in Durban 16 years ago. I was in conference halls like this one, and I was in the streets, raising my voice with thousands of people living with HIV in protest. This is an image from that protest. My organization was lucky to be part of an electrifying new activist and social movement led by people with HIV in South Africa, in Brazil, in Thailand, all over the world. In particular, an extraordinary organization called the Treatment Action Campaign. What were we demanding? Something that at the time, wealthy governments, the public health establishment, and even the UN family, all but an extremely vocal minority of activists, researchers, clinicians, and scientists overrepresented by people in this room, I would add, among people in this room, all but that vocal minority considered unthinkable, that highly active, life-saving antiretroviral therapy must be made available to all people at an affordable price. We demanded at Durban and beyond medication for every nation. This is a sticker people might remember um, on badges of many people um, around the Durban conference 16 years ago. We demanded an end to deadly inequity that meant HIV was a chronic manageable illness for few who lived in rich countries and a death sentence to the vast majority of people with HIV in sub-Saharan Africa and across the developing world. Durban was nothing less than a battleground where people with HIV and their allies exploded myths that now in retrospect must seem almost absurd to people in this room. But at the time, we all remember, they were distortions that were literally killing people. What were they? That there was no way to make medicines affordable. That people in poor countries were simply too irresponsible to take medicines correctly. Or that education systems, clean water, and entire crumbling health systems had to be built or rebuilt first before people got the medicines they needed to live. And that because lifelong treatment for chronic illness had never been attempted for millions of people before in Sub-Saharan Africa, that it simply couldn't be done. Well, we know how that chapter of history concluded. People with HIV, their lovers, their families, their communities were right, and the status quo was dead wrong. Pressure from activists and the weight of scientific evidence slashed the price of medicines, triggered the creation of new funding streams, which we'll get to in a second, because of the concern that they're dwindling or potentially even drying up, particularly for vulnerable populations and for entire swaths of middle-income and upper-middle-income countries where 70% of people with HIV live. This approach was driven by radical new concepts like task shifting, non-facility-based service delivery, and treatment literacy that empowered with information um, uh, those living with HIV, not just as patients, but as actors uh, demanding quality service delivery and quality uh, and well-designed uh, program approaches. So clearly none of this happened by accident. These dramatic shifts were triggered by smart activism in the face of and in reaction to 
uh, incredible revolutionary science. This community decided to act in response to a crisis of conscience from deadly AIDS denialism right here in South Africa then to extortionate pricing by pharmaceutical companies leaving, med leaving medicines out of reach to millions. Why is this important today? Because I would argue that 16 years later, we're fighting for our lives again. Um, 17 million people, as Michelle mentioned, he's left now, um, have access to treatment today because of actions people took together 16 years ago. We have bold treatment targets from the global community. So exciting to find uh, activists, scientists, and the UN family together calling for the same bold treatments, treatment targets, excuse me. In just four years, we know we can reach the 90-90-90 goal. Everyone in this room knows that that's possible. Our science shows it, and operational research shows that it's possible. Even though I would argue too few high burden countries have moved to test and start too slowly, but we'll come to that. Today, we are not on track to reach 90-90-90, and we must demand action aggressively to fix that. Why do I say that? Because from an advocacy perspective, we are not yet halfway there, as David mentioned. Um, what else is important? Well, as Michelle referred to, um, just uh, two days ago, the Kaiser Family Foundation released important new data that in the face of overwhelming evidence that, we ne that we've never had more effective tools at our disposal to finally defeat the AIDS epidemic, unfortunately, 13 of the of 14 top donors have reduced their funding to low and middle income countries. According to UNAIDS, as you know, funding must increase by $7.2 billion to achieve 90-90-90 by 2020. Now, this might seem like a lot of money to all of us in this room who are used to much smaller budgets, but in fact, this is a rounding error for wealthy countries. And I'm alarmed that this gap is, will only grow larger without decisive action from all of us. Likewise, although important progress is being made in reaching 90-90-90, which we have to acknowledge and, uh, and appreciate, UNAIDS has also bravely shown in its prevention gap report that there is broad disparity uh, across regions and across populations when it comes to reaching each of those 90s. And those have to be corrected. We can't engage in math that simply by virtue of focusing on those countries that represent the highest proportion of contribution to the global burden, that somehow we're alighting these disparities and these inequities. We have to address them together. Uh, as a community. So just 16 years ago in 2000, when many governments and decision makers, despite understanding the scientific evidence, declared the fruits of scientific research couldn't reach the millions who are in need, already we're very concerned that there is talk today uh, that would ignore this overwhelming scientific evidence and conclude that treatment as prevention, because of some of these disparities at the program level, and because of this concerning, hopefully not trend, but concerning data point, that because of these things, it is irrational or unrealistic to think that in four years we can't achieve 90-90-90. My presentation is not a pessimistic one. It's simply a note of caution. There's talk that some would see the outcome of reduced funding despite clearly defined an evidence-based funding gap as an immutable truth that cuts in external funding from the Global Fund and other donors, along with donors, uh, with national governments, excuse me, refusal, disappointing refusal to step up and invest in populations that have been systematically ignored for too long as a reason that treatment for all uh, is not achievable. So insofar as science behind 90-90-90 has won the day, an open opposition to the science has melted away we're extremely concerned that far too many are content to sit back and watch insufficient funding and weak program quality undermine implementation of, uh, of the scientific evidence. So I would argue, instead of being defined by these twin realities, there instead must be a clear, coordinated, powerful strategy starting at this conference to change them. 16 years ago, Durban was a turning point. Now we have a new turning point. 
We've never had more powerful tools at our disposal to defeat the AIDS crisis, but funding's being cut, and already we see, Ade referred to this, the vulnerable are already bearing the blunt. If you look at the prevention gap reporting, you see where incidence is surging. It's among criminalized, marginalized, and excluded populations in their communities where global fund funding has been withdrawn and where governments, because they persecute these communities, have not stepped up to fill the gap. What is our responsibility as a global community? It's frankly hypocritical of donors to describe the end of AIDS by 2020 when this kind of unacceptable reversal and threat of continued reversal is at risk of taking place. And that hypocrisy has to stop. We have to do whatever it takes to secure both progressive policy change and the funding shifts that are required. So I'll close my remarks with a few questions for the panel and for the room. Um, will UNAIDS, Michelle's not here, but there are others from UNAIDS in the room, convene an emergency response to the findings of this crucial uh, Kaiser Family Foundation report about this data point regarding reduction in funding that is so hypocritical when it comes at the moment when scientific tools have never been more decisive or more powerful uh, for, for our communities. Will the Global Fund ensure robust service delivery scale up, not just maintaining the games, but expansion in middle income countries and upper middle income countries where 70% of people with HIV live and where the fragile safety net for people who use drugs, gay and bi men and other men who have sex with men, trans populations and sex workers uh, is at risk of simply uh, being shredded to, to pieces because of donor withdrawal. Finally, will implementing governments in the room commit to a top to bottom review of programs to ensure optimal use of funding and a clear identification of the gap to get all people access to treatment? The prevention gap report shows that there are prevention dollars still being spent on low impact, non high impact is the euphemism, but on low impact, ineffective prevention interventions for populations that frankly face a daily struggle um, to say safe and healthy. We must deliver on the benefits of science as quickly as possible to the places where it is most needed and to the communities, frankly, who have put their bodies and their lives on the line over the years participating in the incredible research that many in this room uh, have led. Before 2000, myths had become a consensus. Uh, these, the myths that I've referred to earlier had become almost a consensus that treatment in the poorest re regions of the world was impossible. We could have stood by back then and waited as treatment trickled out slowly with no game-changing advances in access, but instead we used persistent action to break that consensus and to expose these concepts as the fallacies that they were. Today, I'm very concerned there is a risk of a new consensus that delivering on the funding required to achieve treatment for all is impossible. And we can and must anticipate and explode that harmful threat of a negative consensus. Otherwise, what will happen? Well, in another 16 years, we won't be able to stand at an AIDS conference and say that in 2016, we saw the need for a turning point and we seized it. Instead, we'll only be able to reflect on how much the potential, on how much potential, excuse me, the global community had to end this epidemic by 2030 and how it slipped away. So how can you help? How can you start? You can join us tomorrow. If you missed the protest 16 years ago, don't miss it. Tomorrow, uh, be part of Section 27, the Treatment Action Campaign and Health Gaps a massive mobilization of thousands of people from across the world and across South Africa. Uh, leaving at 11 a.m. will be buses from the treatment networking zone um, in the main conference center. And we'll miss you if you're not there with us. Thank you for your time. <laughs>